Thank you, Greg, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the panel on calibrating innovation, opportunity, and urgency. Our panel seems particularly relevant today because we're seeing social determinants of health and the disparities around them be exacerbated and accelerated by the coronavirus pandemic. In particular, we've seen the coronavirus pandemic disproportionately affect the elderly. We've seen higher rates of death among African Americans. We've even seen the CDC issue an advisory telling medical care professionals to be concerned about bias in the way they're treating patients. We're also seeing innovations in this space on the policy level. In Boston in particular, we've seen Pine Street Inn, the home of the shelter, test every resident, setting a national precedent for widespread testing in homeless shelters. We've also seen in New York recently, Governor Cuomo said on Friday that the state was partnering with African-American religious communities to set up COVID testing in African-American churches in the hopes of, again, addressing disparities. So I'm particularly pleased that this is the hard issue we're gonna be tackling today. And we have really great experts that I'm happy to introduce who are gonna tackle these tension laden issues. We have Dr. Krishna Yeshwant from Google Ventures. We have Amit Fadnis from GE. And we have Giles Boland, Dr. Giles Boland from Brigham Health. So Giles, I was hoping you would kick this off because you've been involved in this incredible innovation during the pandemic, which is to oversee the fast building of the Boston Hope Medical Hospital. Um, dealing with a thousand patients, 500 of whom are homeless. And so I was hoping you would talk about both the kind of incredible innovation in standing this thing up and about the innovation it's how it's operating with these divided populations of post-acute care and homeless folks. Uh, thanks, Natasha, and good afternoon, everyone, or wherever you may be. Uh, so I'm a chair of radiology at the Brigham uh, here in Boston, but got tasked about six weeks ago to uh, co-direct uh, what we now call Boston Hope, which is the, ma the main field hospital for Massachusetts. And at the beginning of April, uh, when I first visited it, uh, it was a concrete uh, floor in this uh, Boston uh, Convention Center. And within a week, uh, we had put in 500 bed post-acute beds uh, and 500 beds for the undomiciled uh, uh, population. Uh, so you, as you can imagine, to go from a concrete floor to a fully operational hospital within a, a single week is a daunting task and clearly uh, required uh, a lot of innovation and on-the-fly uh, on thinking to be able to adapt to uh, th this enormous task. Um, and we managed to achieve that. Within a week, we actually did start to accept our first patients, and we've now been operational for five weeks or so and have treated several hundred patients on the hospital side and several hundred on the what we call the respite side, the undomiciled side. So I, the things that I think I've learned in terms of innovation uh, for this is uh, really the interdisciplinary teams uh, and the way it's required both medical and non-medical teams to bring this about. Uh, we were very fortunate that our overall command leadership was with um, General Hammond, who has military experience and was a brigadier general. And uh, from experiences from others who built field hospitals, for instance, in Africa and elsewhere under Ebola responses, uh, one of the lessons learned from there that the, the, these field hospitals, uh, in particularly the logistics, are best served by having a combination of teams between medical teams, and uh, military teams, frankly, who, who this is what they do uh, in war. And so we were able to learn from them uh, as to how to do this. And of course, with our um, fortunate, uh, enormous resources in the Boston metropolitan area, we were able to staff this up and um, uh, obtain the, uh, the um, uh, medical equipment to be able to care for these patients. Uh, just briefly, the, uh, the model of care which is an innovation itself, because essentially we, we, we're sort of making this up as we go along. We've never had this COVID uh, experience before, is we decide, and I think it was the right model, to accept patients who what we call post-acute, uh, rather than the sickest, sickest of patients. And what this means is we take patients who are recovering from the hospital, from their acute care, either in the intensive care units or on the medical floors, who are not yet ready to go home, but need somewhere to be cared for because they still have uh, moderate, uh, mild to moderate uh, medical care needs. 
and the vision there was to be able to decompress the acute hospitals uh, with, uh, with these patients to uh, Boston Hope, the field hospital, such that they could then focus on the sickest, sickest of patients who were coming in through the emergency rooms and actually to, uh, also to redeploy in the acute hospitals their, their staff to focus on those patients, build the additional intensive care units and care for the patients. And that actually was a critical strategy in, in the Boston metropolitan area to be able to manage the surge. And as part of that, the innovation and the strategy was to decompress, as I said, uh, patients as they recover to the field hospital. Thanks, Giles. I'm going, now, to come back uh, and ask you, I'm going to come back to you and ask you more about that. But I want to go to Amit for a minute yep. because we've talked about how we've seen a surge in digital medicine because of the pandemic. People are at home, social distancing, and we've seen a surge in telemedicine. But we've also spoken about how there are a huge number of Americans who don't have smartphones. About a third of people 65 and older, for example, don't have smartphones. And so we've got a digital divide, even as some of these tools are being used by people actually who are better off. And so, Amit, I wanted to ask you, like, what kind of integration of technology or other things can we do to address this kind of digital divide, which is exacerbating health disparities? Yeah, Natasha, great question. Uh, you know, actually, as we speak to a number of health systems across the world, um, you know, there are some themes that have emerged, you know, obviously virtual, you know, because of social distancing, uh, telehealth, telemedicine, you know, we have heard, you know, this several times today as themes, but these themes are pretty relevant across the globe, not just in the US. The second thing that we are hearing is that many of these themes are here to stay, even after you know, the current sort of crisis uh, goes away, hopefully, uh, because people are finding that uh, it's effective, you know, it results in productivity and so on and so forth. The third thing that we are seeing as a result of what's going on right now uh, is that there is a huge applicability of technology, data, communication methodologies, and so on and so forth to make this effective, right? Because, uh, you know, there are a number of patients who are being treated remotely. In fact, uh, the number of online consults globally have gone up 50 to 100 times in most of the health systems already, okay? Uh, but as, as we do that, there is a tremendous amount of data uh, that needs to be processed. And this needs to be processed in a way uh, where population health can, you know, can be used, population health parameters can be used for predictive purposes. Now, you know, you sort of mentioned one of the challenges there. Uh, and which is, you know, the technology is not all pervasive uh, across the population. You know, take smartphones, for example. Uh, you know, a small percentage of uh, people still have smartphones. A number of people don't actually have smartphones today. But the reality is that you can actually use technology very effectively, even if everybody doesn't have a consistency of the devices or access to technology. Right? You've seen in Africa as well as in India, you know, uh, the government's using you know, cell phone coverage, okay, and different types of devices uh, that are available to people to actually map out population, map out hotspots, uh, you know, as well as be able to trace people, uh, you know, as they, as they do, do contact tracing and so on and so forth. But I think the key here is going to be to use multi-channel, whether it is smartphones, normal phones, television, in combination with 5G type of technologies so that we can actually cover the population specifically. Well, we talked about one of the interesting things we're seeing in India, for example, is that the government has a national contact tracing app and they've gotten tens of millions of people to download the app and it checks you know, your location and it uses Bluetooth signals to log other phones. But many millions of people in India don't have phones and one of the things we're seeing them do is when they map hotspots of infection of people who do have smartphones, they then send physical epidemiologists and contact tracing teams into the area to go door to door and um, tell people that they may need to be tested and warn them they're being exposed. So basically we're taking information from people who have the technology um, and using it to try to address some of these disparities. Um, and that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about Krishna because we have seen the coronavirus accelerate things like contact tracing apps in healthcare, but we've also seen uh, the pandemic accelerate these disparities both in health and healthcare. And you have said yourself, there's no app to address this. 
So what kind of policy innovations might we need to address some of these disparities, both at this critical moment and then going forward? Yeah, so uh, thank you for, for having me here. Um, you know, the, the, the concept of social uh, determinants of health uh, you know, goes uh, obviously way, way back. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, in, in some ways, uh, the coronavirus experience um, is really just revealing uh, a lot of the underlying uh, uh, fragmentation and uh, underperformance of our, of our overall uh, system. Not just the health system. Uh, in fact, um, uh, when I think of social determinants of health, so social determinants of health, I think of things like uh, the economic uh, stability uh, of of the person we're talking about, the neighborhood they're living in, the education they have access to, food stability. Uh, these sorts of things um, uh, really go well beyond just the health system. And in point of fact, uh, 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 as you take a step back, you realize all these things actually are quite intertwined. Uh, you know, if somebody has um, uh, poor access to food, uh, it'll be very hard for them to recover uh, on the other end of, of getting the great care that, uh, that I think the hospital systems are able uh, to, uh, to stretch and, and provide using uh, things like the, uh, the field hospital we were talking about earlier. Uh, but, you know, where, how do we take care of uh, patients uh, after that uh, if, if the places that they're going back to uh, uh, don't allow them to recover? And then, of course, we think about how did they end up? Uh, in the hospital to begin with, you look even at a at a, at a, at a, um, a more um, uh, forward-looking town like uh, like Boston, uh, Massachusetts, more broadly, uh, you know, which has invested in some of these uh, uh, these areas over time, uh, and yet we're still um, we're still seeing the communities that are most affected by uh, the coronavirus to be the ones where uh, all of these uh, determinants, so to speak, and, and these underlying social supports. Um, you know, really continue to, to, to be strained. Uh, so cities like Chelsea, we're seeing such an extreme uh, a difference uh, in, in, in the population there uh, and the, and the uh, impact that the, the this virus has had there versus uh, other communities which have been able to uh, maybe have more social uh, distancing uh, uh, during the time. So I think, I think all of these things end up being intertwined and um, sitting, sitting at Google Ventures, I'd, I'd love for it to be the case that, um, that we could uh, release an app or uh, update, um, you know, a website in some way and, and fix these issues. But um, but but I think in the end, um, uh, these are far more complex social issues. Now, of course, technology um, uh, can once once we have the resources and have the alignment uh, to say we're going to invest in, in in these sorts of underlying societal supports, uh, technology can dramatically uh, accelerate and provide a great uh, a lever. And Krishna, uh, in, in bringing people back, access. I want to come back to you on the technology question. Uh, but I, since we're still on the disparity question, I want to um, sort of take it back to Giles because one of the innovations, Giles, that we're seeing that you're putting in place at Boston Hope is addressing people's socio cultural and economic differences, not just on the um, homeless side, but on the acute side. You've got patients who want to celebrate Ramadan. You've got uh, patients who speak lots of different languages, none of them English. Um, and we've also seen that, you know, in healthcare, some immunity responses and things depend on well-being. And so I'm really interested in how are you addressing these social differences in an innovative way at Boston Health? Yeah, we're, we're very sensitive to that. And, and as Krishna has said, uh, COVID has really exposed the, the social determinants health in a, in a in a way that really should be a wake-up call for, for everyone. And um, uh, uh, an article in the uh, JAMA on the 15th, I believe by uh, 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 Clyde Yancey said, this is an ethical reckoning in some ways uh, that COVID should present us. Um, but we've recognized um, the cultural, spiritual, emotional, uh, mental health needs uh, of the, these, these folks coming in, many of whom are economically challenged, underrepresented minorities, etc. And frankly, it's, it's a stark concrete floor uh, in a very large atrium, a very large building, and no one wants to get COVID, no one wants to go to hospital with COVID, and I doubt anyone really would sign up to go to a field hospital uh, with COVID readily either. So we've really had a lot of intentional focus on the holistic nature to care uh, in the field hospital. And we're very fortunate that we've had many, many volunteers. And I think one of the things that, that is a positive thing in this crisis is that people are offering their services um, from wherever they come from. And we've been very fortunate that we have rabbis, priests, 
um, uh, and uh, other uh, religious uh, folks who virtually provide services, uh, imams, etc., to our uh, patients. We have obviously rehab services, but they're getting that probably th three to four hours a day. They would be lucky if they got, got an hour of that in a regular hospital, seven days a week. We have mental health and psychiatric services. We have translator services. We have wellness programs. So there are a whole range of activities that we are um, trying to support patients, many of whom uh, their primary language is not English, etc to uh, look after their well-being, uh, whatever nature th uh, that is, whether it's spiritual, mental, emotional, etc., because these are tough times for them. And of course, they're going to go back into tough environments. This gets back to what Krishna is saying. They're going to go right back into these environments where, um, you know, for frankly, for centuries, we've been looking at social determinants of health in, in terms of the underprivileged. And, you know, we haven't moved the needle that much. Uh, and so they're going to go right back into these communities, but we're going to position and hopefully prepare them as best as we can in a field hospital setting to reintegrate back to where they are. And then, uh, you know, we'll leave it to the policymakers uh, and others to try and get at these social determinants of health. But are there any learnings from what you're doing and Krishna um, and Amit from what you're seeing that could be applied when people who are being cared for in this wraparound holistic way are now going back. So for example, you know, to use Pine Street Inn again, one of the things that they're doing is thinking about how are they gonna reconfigure homeless shelters going forward, not just for the next wave of the pandemic, but you know, for the long term, you're not gonna be able to have rooms with lots of people spending the night anymore. And so I'm interested in, in the short term and also as we prepare um, for the next wave of the pandemic, are there any things we have learned that we can do to address these things on a larger level? Um, I don't know, Krishna, if you wanna start. You know, I would, I would start low tech, um, you know, low tech and simple. Uh, you know, I think we're gonna have tremendous logistical challenges ahead of us. Uh, you know, not just uh, in our homeless population, you think even going into the, um, the number of unemployed uh, people in our population who uh, may start to struggle with access to food, uh, you know, I think I think these sorts of things are going to be profoundly important uh, in in the coming weeks, coming months, uh, quarters ahead of us. And um, you know, I think I think there are tremendous things that artificial intelligence and mobile technology. I think these are the infrastructure of our day, um, and I think we should use them. Uh, but but I, I don't think we should um, uh, try to uh, out innovate. Uh, ourselves when, when we're, we're, we're just trying to think about how do we get uh, food, how do we get um, housing uh, to people who need, need them. I, you know, I don't know that uh, you know, the phone is going to, to provide uh, the social distance, distancing that's needed uh, in, a, in a homeless shelter. I do think that some of the, the contact tracing could be uh, uh, accelerated uh, or kind of in assisted. But again, digital contact tracing, uh, not enough. Uh, you know, we, need, we need normal contact tracing assisted by uh, digital contract tracing to have the sort of uh, real health and um, uh, and community impact that, that that I think we need to 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 mitigate some of the damage that uh, that we're likely to continue to see over the coming uh, the coming uh, weeks. And Amit, how are you thinking about this? Yeah, so so look, you know, I, I, you know, Krishna sort of covered this well. I think there is a significant amount of technology that can be applied here, but we have to be careful about how we apply that. For example, you know we have to process a huge amount of information and data. Uh, and data analytics and AI is going to play a very, very key role. But at the same time, we need to see how we're going to disseminate that information to different, you know, different parts of the population, depending on what access they have uh, to technologies. Simple thing, right? You can, you can actually collect a lot of information from regions and from populations or hotspots. You can process that using AI, which is going to happen, obviously. But as you disseminate that information, you need to look at different other technologies, including natural language processing, you know, local language support. You know, countries have done simple things like modifying the ringtones to sort of give vital information and messages, depending on what's happening in specific areas based on the data that has been processed, right? So I think, I think our ability to disseminate information in a way uh, that can be actually absorbed and consumed by different strata of the population is going to be absolutely key because as these people go back, as they recover, as they come back, or come back into jobs, you know, one thing that they're going to absolutely need is correct information, education, and the information about their surroundings, right? 
And if we can use, a, you know, technologies like 5G or communication technologies and data analytics and AI, along with NLP and natural language processing, we can make a huge difference using technology. But just AI won't help, right? Just data analytics won't help unless it is combined with, you know, how do you actually take this information and effectively you utilize that information across the different population spread of this. Thank you. I mean, and Giles, in the 20 seconds we have left, what are the non-technical approaches we might take? I know you're not entirely optimistic, right. but t tell us where we go from no. here. Well, I, I, my personal opinion is uh, it's really going to be from the grassroots. The, the challenge with the virtual platforms and technology, that's often uh, for the privileged. And here folks are just dealing with their housing, their food, as we've heard, etc. So I, I think we really have to learn from grassroots organizations, from churches, from libraries, from local schools, etc., to leverage what we can for um, uh, economically challenged folks and build it from there.